This is Colin McEnroe. We're doing something a little bit different uh, from even what we do ordinarily on a Monday, simply because on Friday, uh, sort of the, in the mid to late afternoon, thousands and thousands of pages of a so-called final report on the Newtown shootings uh, were released to the public and the press. Um, we've had the weekend to chew over some of them. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about what lessons can and can't be learned, what's in this report, what isn't in the report, and and how to react to what we now know going forward. So we have some uh, very interesting guests for you. In just a little while, you'll meet or perhaps re-meet uh, Dr. Hank Schwartz. He's the psychiatrist-in-chief at the Institute of Living and vice president of behavioral health for Hartford Hospital. Susan Schmeiser, who is a professor of law at the University of Connecticut School of Law uh, and who teaches mental health law. Uh, and uh, Jeff Cohen, our own uh, Jeff Cohen reporter for WNPR, who's been covering not only the Newtown shootings, but uh, most recently um, some of the rather complicated and at times fascinating uh, questions about confidentiality. What kinds of records uh, can the public see and what can't they see, uh, particularly as pertains to the mental health of somebody like uh, and, and the treatment of somebody like Adam Lanza. We've got a lot of ground to cover here today. Um, we're going to start, though, uh, with Kevin Kane. He is the chief state's attorney for Connecticut. Uh, he joins us now by phone. First of all, um, Kevin Kane, welcome to the show. Good morning, Colin. How are you? We're all just fine. So, um, obviously, it's been a long wait for this report. Uh, it was preceded by the uh, summary by uh, one of your state's attorneys, uh, Mr. Sedensky. Well, what do you think there is of value or significance in this final report? What, what is it that you're releasing to the public that you think could be the basis for future policy or deeper understanding of what happened? Well, with regard to Steve Sedensky's job was very limited, and it did not really involve that. Initially, his job was to determine and to make sure that there was nobody else involved uh, in any criminal conduct uh, relating to this incident, either in the by being present at the scene and aiding and abetting uh, physically Adam Lanz's conduct, or, and this is the complicated part, uh, engaged prior to that in some activity which could have made them criminally liable as accessories or conspirators. Uh, and there was information that had to be gathered, uh, and Steve had to be satisfied before he could decide to uh, allow the, st the state police to close the investigation out. That was partly the time-consuming part. Now, as far as uh, gathering this information and making it known to others. There's a lot of information that uh, that, that others should need to consider, should consider, uh, at least the beginnings of, of, of information that, that should enable others to consider, to determine how to identify people who may be acting and uh, who may be capable of doing such things. There's a whole uh, section that hasn't been dealt with concerning mental illness and any role mental illness that may have played in this how things like uh, how there may be red flags to recognize behavior like this and what may be done with regard to making treatment available and getting people who don't want to comply with recommendations uh, or comply with treatment, getting them ways to uh, finding ways to help them comply. You know, to, to that end, I mean, this this report, and there's thousands and thousands of pages, and I, nobody here has read all of them, but the report seems very heavy on paperwork. There are a lot of copies of forms that, you know, for logging photos and evidence and, right. and dealing, dealing with this, the procedure, the day-to-day -day painstaking uh, procedure of police work and law enforcement. Not so heavy on original documents. We see a lot of summar summaries of original documents, ranging from summaries from actual things that Adam Lanza wrote, like an eight-page document titled Me that apparently sums up. Right his views on things, to um, summaries of some of the psychiatric care that he, he had. Now, why, why aren't the actual documents available? Why can't uh, a person interested in Adam Lanza's state of mind and possible uh, ways to prevent future Adam Lanza's see this eight-page document titled Me? Why can't we read reports uh, about his actual treatment? Some of the documents which the state police were able to obtain were giving to the, given to them voluntarily by, by people who had them. Uh, some of them contain information that is privileged to one degree or another, and the psychiatric privilege uh, survives death. Uh, and and uh, the original documents were were described to some degree there. The state does not have subpoena power. This is not a case where we could have gotten or did get a grand jury investigation to subpoena those documents and obtain them. Uh, through other ways. So there is, 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 the documents are not available for the public, at least through us. Steve Sedensky so, met and, and, mm -hmm. and met 
long, way back, long ago, with the governor's task force, uh, at least with the chairman of the governor's task force, and with the legislative task force, and offered to at least give them direction where they might be able to obtain some of this information by themselves if they had subpoena power. Um, a couple of times I've read or seen reference to the fact that federal officials have some of these documents or had some of these documents. And I realize some of those documents were things that were shared with Quantico as part of their profiling project. But I get the feeling also, is, is there a separate federal investigation that's going on here? The federal, uh, the, from day one, uh, the state police and the federal authorities worked very closely together, as did Steve Sedensky and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office did have subpoena power because the federal grand jury laws are very different than ours. Uh, so they had access to information which was shared uh, with the state. The state at least uh, was allowed to look at them and read them, and, and uh, uh, but copies were not uh, provided to the state. Is that federal grand jury now closed? Is, is that, is, I it's... can't even really acknowledge that other than saying they have subpoena power and they have grand jury authority. Uh, the fact mm. that that a grand jury is ongoing or, or if a grand jury is actually involved is something that the federal laws prohibit anybody involved mm. from disclosing. Let me ask you sort of a separate question uh, as chief state's attorney. One, one of the things in terms of policy, in terms of our understanding of policy and yours, now that we've been through all of this, I think one question that some of us have is imagine a comparable and nearly identical situation unfolding. Uh, that on, on this occasion the police know about. So you have uh, a young man exhibiting signs of severe disturbance, possibly being inadequately treated uh, with access to a pile of firearms. Um, what are your options in that situation? If, if you knew about someone nearly identical to Adam Lanza uh, who had not yet committed a crime, would be, there be a single thing you could do about it? We could. If, we, if the police had probable cause to believe or reasonable grounds to believe that a person was a danger to himself or others and had firearms in a particular location, the police can apply for a search warrant to go in and, and search for and seize those firearms uh, and hold them pending a court hearing to determine whether or not the firearms should be given back to the, the, the possessor. And, and uh, how do you establish that danger to self and others? We can establish it through... Uh, and and this is done. It's not infrequent that this is done, uh, usually because a person engaged in threatening behavior, verbal threats, physical, uh, physically intimidating people, uh, causes somebody else to be in fear of their lives, uh, uh, and that can be the established through statements of people who are witnesses. Of course, Adam Lanza, to the best of our knowledge and to, from everything that we've gleaned from this report, had never engaged in threatening behavior. In other words, uh, um, looking at everything that you've shared with us, it's hard to see how if you had known everything that you know now, you could have gone to court and either gotten permission to seize his firearms or involuntarily commit him. I, I mean, how many options do you really have in a lot of these situations? In situations like this, they were extremely limited, and I agree we probably couldn't have, have uh, based on the information that was certainly was known then or even is known now, probably could not have gotten a search warrant uh, to seize those, those firearms. Uh, the fact that somebody's mentally ill doesn't mean he's a danger to himself or others. Uh, the fact that somebody is fascinating, fascinated with, with mass uh, murders does not mean that he himself is a danger to himself or others. Uh, uh, so that's a, a pretty complicated area. We do have areas where somebody uh, does threaten somebody, uh, and there it's easier. You're you're dealing with a situation not unlike this right now, right? Well, the case of William Dong, he was on the campus of the University of New Haven. He had two loaded handgun-type firearms. He had a Bushmaster, a pretty much identical weapon to Adam Lanza's, in his car. He had uh, 2,700 rounds of ammunition found at his house. Um, he's being held, uh, I, I think, right now on charges, and there's a new court date on January 14th. Is this a similar kind of situation where you have to sort of figure out what your legal options are? Yes, we do. Mm. We clearly do have to figure out what the legal options are. I can't comment on that because it is a pending case. Mm. But there are a few cases where we're, and fortunately, extremely few in number, where it's very difficult to, to determine how far we can go to take somebody's uh, firearms or weapons to search for them and seize them uh, because they can present a, a danger to themselves mm. or others. There are people who, who, who have... Uh, who may well be
be in possession of firearms and and be have a mental illness but not be a danger to others um chief state's attorney kevin king last question you've got a busy day ahead of you and i'm very grateful for you to taking take the time to talk to uh, to us about this you know this report it did take a long time to come out and you've explained one of the reasons it took a long time to come out it did come out ultimately on the friday between two holidays, uh, you know, this kind of famously in the business of uh, the interactions between government and the press, uh, late Friday afternoon is when you release something that you really don't particularly relish having to, to, to release or that you don't particularly want to share with the press or the public, and certainly putting it between Christmas and New Year's intensifies that effect. Is there some sense in which you or uh, or anybody else connected with this just you really didn't relish having to release this information, either because of the sensitivities of people back in Newtown or for some other the reason we certainly didn't time it uh, in the ma- in the manner in which the time it was released might have suggested uh, I mean is that something I've thought of in the past over the over many years maybe would have done it we didn't do that here mm-hmm. that getting that report out took a phenomenal amount of work uh, work that is hard to explain and that, that that probably the public won't realize but it took a huge amount of work and a huge amount of time pressure uh, to get it under. Uh, the, the first effort when Steve's report was released was to get it out before the anniversary date. Uh, and it just took a, a, a large am- amount of time to, to do the paperwork, to compile it, to put in order, to make redactions, which the law required. Uh, yes, we certainly did not like uh, uh, It's not something that was comfortable to release and have the families read it. Uh, it was far better to get it over with as early as, early as we could without prolonging that, but, but uh, there wasn't a deliberate attempt to release it on, on a uh, Friday afternoon when nobody would pay attention. We knew this as soon as it was, was going to be released, it would go viral. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it certainly, to a certain degree, has. Uh, Kevin Kane, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I know Thank you've you. You've had a busy day. Thank you. Uh, it's Chief uh, State's Attorney Kevin Kane. Let me just uh, just to finish up this segment. We're going to have a, a conversation uh, with Jim Smith. Jim Smith is um, well, he's a number of things. He's president of the Connecticut Council on Freedom of Information and serves on the task force on victim privacy and the public's right to know. That is the task force established by the legislature at the end of the last session uh, as a way of dealing with uh, another act that it had passed restricting access to, to homicide crime scene photos. So, uh, Jim Smith, uh, I, I know you probably haven't read that. The thousands and thousands and thousands of pages uh, of the of the chief states, uh, excuse me, of the the final report on the Newtown shooting, um, but you have read some. And what's your overall reaction to it? Well, hello, Colin. Thanks Hi, for Jim. having me on. Um, well, it's it's sort of more more of the same. Uh, police and prosecutors, uh, frankly, they just don't like to release information, and so the the the, the report is way over redacted. Um, it's, uh, they, they quote, um, exemptions in the FOI law. They misquote the exemptions to, to, to uh, support their redactions and they really should have been, well, you know, what we're operating on this report, what we're doing is we're operating under half truths or, or, or partial truths. Um, we in the press, we, we try to look for the whole truth and it, it's just not in this, in the 7,000 page document. Um, you're working on this task force, um, uh, they're going to be making recommendations to the legislature. Um, will, I mean, and, and some of that just has to do is very specifically with photos, but it seems as though there are larger questions. Um, and, and does this task force uh, report, excuse me, does this final report on Newtown, does it sort of change any of your thinking about this, or does it make you more inclined to push for certain kinds uh, of legislation this next time around? Well, uh, the task force was um, really an exercise in frustration. There were there are 17 members picked by the governor and, and legislators, and and from the very beginning they made sure that the majority uh, uh, favored uh, privacy and secrecy over the people's right to know, and so it was not a surprise in the final vote that, um, that uh, the task force is recommending to the legislature that that we hide crime scene photos, that we hide that we hide 911 some of the 911 calls. Um, and and we uh, we adopt a, a whole new burden of proof on uh, on ever getting to see those things. Um, it used to be uh, the Connecticut FOI law was one of the best in the country, but 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 now the, if the legislature adopts what the task force is recommending, the burden of proof shifts to the public, where historically 
the burden of proof is on the government to say why something needs to remain private. Um, now uh, the burden will move to the to the to the public and the press to prove that it needs to be public. That's a huge shift in Connecticut FOI uh, legislation. Jim Smith, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. We uh, know you have a busy day. We also have a, a full slate of uh, guests here and a lot of ground to cover. We're going to take a quick break here. We're going to come back with Dr. Hank Schwartz, Susan Schmeiser, uh, and Jeff Cohen. All right, we're back. Uh, we're talking about um, the reactions to the final report uh, of the state on the shootings at Newtown. Uh, in studio with us, as I said before, Dr. Hank Schwartz, psychi psychiatrist in chief of the Institute of Living, vice president of behavioral health at Harvard Hospital, Susan Schmeiser, a professor of law at the University of Connecticut School of Law, specializing in mental health law with us in, in studio also is uh, WNPR reporter Jeff Cohen. Uh, we'll also be happy to hear from you at 860-275-7266. That's 860-275-7266. Seven two six six. Hank Schwartz, you've been obviously you're on a different task force that has to make re recommendations about this. You've expressed some frustration in the past about what information you're getting uh, and whether it's enough to help you shape effective recommendations uh, on lessons learned after Newtown and 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 laws that might be passed, um, new policies that might be enacted uh, to cope with some of the realities post Newtown. Uh, now that you have this final report, and once again it's thousands of pages, nobody's read them all. Uh, what are your overall thoughts? Well, I'd start by saying that uh, I'm not sure that it's appropriate to actually call this a report. It's really a compendium of thousands of investigative reports and other documents that are um, put together in a variety of files with no usable index or table of contents. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's necessary to open up every single file and look at every single page in order to... Uh, try to find if, uh, the information that you're looking for. So uh, to start with, as you indicated earlier, probably very few people have yet actually reviewed um, all, all of these documents. But um, many of the documents are extensively redacted, uh, if not entirely redacted. Um, as far as the medical reports, um, and I'm obviously very interested in the, in the psychiatric, uh, anything that has uh, bearing for the psychiatric history, None of the original uh, records are included. Um, we read uh, summaries of many of them, and you know our, our knowledge of of Lanza's personal history is a little bit advanced by reading these summaries from uh, where we were a couple of weeks ago when we just had uh, Sedensky's summary of this report. But I think um, our knowledge is not. Do, just uh, taken far enough. Um, again, we don't we don't have the basic materials that uh, would really advance our understanding of Lanza's mental state, uh, the history of his assessments and um, the treatments that were offered, um, and et cetera. Um, with regard to the question of confidentiality of medical records preventing us from having this material, I think it's worth noting, um, as Jeff, you had um, reported on earlier, that confidentiality, um, the HIPAA does not prevent the disclosure of medical records that are held um, by law enforcement agencies. And so while it's true that confidentiality generally extends uh, beyond, beyond death, um, it uh, does not in this particular case. And it's also true that the uh, executor of the estate, in this case that would be Adam Lanza's uh, father, has the authority to release these documents to whomever he would care to release them to. Susan Schmeiser, is that your understanding too? I see you nodding over there. Is it, is it first of all, that broad and that simple? Anything that law enforcement now has could, could be exempted from HIPAA or would, would not be covered by HIPAA? Well, um, law, law enforcement wouldn't uh, qualify as a covered entity under HIPAA. So, yeah, I don't think HIPAA applies to, to law enforcement and the records that it holds. Um, yeah, I, my understanding is that uh, if Peter Lanza is the next of kin or the administrator of um, Adam Lanza's estate, I guess he, he wouldn't have a formal executor probably unless he had a will. Um, 
then he has the authority to consent to disclosure of these records. Is there any other law that would militate against that? In other words, is there any other law that does shield uh, particularly mental health records in in any particular Uh, way? There's extensive state law on this issue. But um, but again, my understanding is that uh, a personal representative such as Peter Lanza would would be able to consent to the disclosure of the records. I mean, maybe for limited purposes or for um, specific purposes, but but I I think that would be within his discretion. I don't. This isn't my area, but mm. that's my understanding. Jeff Cohen, this is sort of your area, at least in the sense that you've been told a number of different stories by public officials uh, and read different statements by public officials about what would or would not be available, what is or isn't covered by HIPAA or any other privacy laws. And I know you've made a, a, a long effort to try to understand this better. What's the state of your understanding now? Well, I think we started with HIPAA, Colin, because the governor was in this room and saying, "Look, there are lots of laws that." Protect protect the release of documents, HIPAA, he, he references, and, and he says per, one's personal uh, medical privacy rights extend after death. Well, again, HIPAA is a law that protects uh, medical records that are in the custody of covered entities, and covered entities are things like your doctor or your health care provider or your billing company or the insurance agency, so so they can't share them without your consent, I suppose. But once once those documents leave their custody and they're in someone else's custody, HIPAA doesn't apply anymore. So then what state law applies? Well, there are lots of state laws that say that medical records and psychiatric re- records are are have a right of confidentiality, but that right can be waived. But even if it isn't, there's still state FOI law. These are now public documents. Adam, Lent, to the extent that Peter Lanz signed a waiver, and I believe he did, and it's in this document dump. To the extent he signed a waiver and gave those documents to the state police, or to the extent that the state police have them, they are now public documents. And if we, if if they are uh, requested, then there's a pretty high bar that has to be met for the state to pol- police to deny uh, their disclosure. The bar that they don't get over. Uh, is whether or not this is a matter of legitimate public concern. And if they can't demonstrate, that, that would be their challenge in front of the FOI commission. They would have to demonstrate that, that knowing more about Adam Lanz's personal medical and mental health history was not a matter of legitimate public concern. And this isn't just reporters who generally like to seek uh, access to documents as a matter of course, but this is a government agency in the case of Hank Schwartz's, the commission that, uh, that he is a part of, appointed by the governor, frustrated in its own work by the state's own privacy laws. So this is an interesting dynamic that we're seeing develop. You know, let's sort of go back to uh, what we talked about with Kevin Kane, and I, I thought it was sort of a significant moment when he said, no, given basically the fact patterns we know it about Adam Lanza, if the police had known everything that they know now, uh, there really isn't a thing that they could do about uh, him based on his not having broken any laws, and there just aren't, aren't any other laws that, that Kevin Kane, uh, the chief state's attorney, could see that he could I- invoke. Um, first of all, Susan Schmeiser, is that sort of your understanding of, of how things are? Um, yeah, well, well, under Connecticut law, the um, the police can seek a warrant to seize firearms um, from any person who poses a risk of imminent harm or personal injury to him or herself or others. Um, the way you posed the hypothetical sort of presumed that we knew enough about Adam Lanza to know that he did pose a risk. Mm-hmm. And so under those facts, then I, I think probably they would be able to get a warrant. But but, see, but until, yeah. I mean, based on, yeah. on what's in the report that we, we can read, there there might not be really anything ultimately that any clinician knew right. or that anybody knew right. that would suggest that he was anything other than an ordinary developmentally challenged person with, you know, mental health issues X, Y, and Z, which we can either talk about or not talk about depending on whether we think we have enough information. That's right. Well, it seems like um, his contact with mental health professionals um, really ceased or tapered at least um, several years before the shootings at Sandy Hook. And so um, at the time that he was interacting with mental health professionals and others, there weren't clear indications that he posed a danger. Um, If we knew more about his life in, say, the year or the months leading up to the shootings, then then we would perhaps have enough to to base... um, uh, an assessment of imminent risk. You know, Hank, this is such a knife's edge for somebody like you. Um, uh, On the one hand, as a uh, career mental health clinician, you want a clinical environment where I, the patient, can come in and say, I really hate my boss. I wish my boss were dead, you know, that I can express anger at my parents, at my spouse, at my teachers, whoever it is, that I I can 
in, in a confidential situation, talk about some of my darkest thoughts without your handing my medical records over to law enforcement at the slightest quiver. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we now have some of these object lessons, which are, are, are terrifying and, and instructive in certain ways. Um, I assume this is one of the things you're struggling with right now. How do you balance those two things? The mental health professions and society struggles with this issue constantly, and that's the the balance between protecting the individual autonomous rights of patients uh, and, on the other hand, the need to treat, the paternalistic uh, position of the state to treat people who may be in danger and protection of public safety. And how to get that balance right um, befuddles us time and and time again. It's... uh, true uh, in this instance. I think if you look back uh, at what we've got, what we've been able to see in the record, uh, I'd agree. There was nothing that any of our laws would would have set off any right through the laws as we currently understand them to take any action that would have uh, prevented uh, Adam Lanza from from doing what he did. Um, There's an interesting three-month period leading up to the incident in which, as uh, as most people have probably read in the newspapers, he covered his windows with uh, black plastic, withdrew entirely, spoke to no one other than to uh, his mother um, via email. And we had an, an interesting uh, element in the report, and that was um, an interview with a friend of Nancy Lanza's uh, two weeks before the incident, in which she said that Lanza was growing more and more despondent. That's the only thing we know about his mental state during that two-month period. But it does suggest a deterioration. I would say it, it, it suggests as possible um, a deterioration into uh, a psychotic condition. Now, if we'd known that, which of course was unknowable, if he'd been brought psychotic and delusional into an emergency room and a psychiatrist in an emergency room had Uh, learned upon interview of his mother of the availability of of guns in the home and a delusional delusional mental state that perhaps um, created a risk, it's possible he might have been involuntarily hospitalized. Uh, But, of course, you know, these are just um, uh, suppositions uh, after the fact into a mental state that, that we can never know anything about. Um, did you want to respond? And then I want to go to Jeff. And I just yeah. wanted to go back to something um, Dr. Schwartz uh, mentioned in the first part of his remark, which was this um, abiding tension between kind of respecting people's autonomy rights and uh, paternalism and or kind of concerns for public safety. But, you know, lots of people, and I'm sure Dr. Schwartz agrees, have made the, the argument persuasively that um, respect for autonomy rights can actually further public safety because – um, if you, uh, for instance, allow people to seek treatment with guarantees of confidentiality, if you encourage them to do so voluntarily, et cetera, et cetera, they're more likely to seek treatment and to and to um, and to be, you know, effectively treated. And 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 so, it's not always the case that that the two are in opposition to one another. Yeah, go ahead, and then Jeff. And it's ver- it's very easy um, to uh, to enact laws that really uh, tread on autonomy rights in in ways that can um, negatively affect both the therapeutic relationship and negatively affect patient safety. So I mean, New- it, lo- it looks like New York State may have done something pretty close to that. New York State jumped right into it. Uh, New York State now is a law that requires any mental health professional to report to the state anybody who may be dangerous. Um, That's a dangerous law, I think, for the degree to which um, reporting um, in in that fashion, A, puts the mental health professional in an untenable situation and erodes the therapeutic relationship between between patient and professional. But, Hank, what is that relationship now? If you could explain it, I think this is a question that those of us who are not in the field might like to answer. So you're, you're presented with a patient, a patient's in your office, and you feel like this patient um, could possibly present a public safety risk. What what in Connecticut? What can you do? What 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 must you do, or what can you do in that situation? Well, it depends on the nature of the public safety risk that I, I feel the patient may be presenting. But certainly, if the patient um, seems to be dangerous to self or others um, above a threshold that would require 
psychiatric hospitalization, I have an obligation to attempt to have that patient hospitalized. If the patient is in my office and is in an outpatient setting and is voluntarily there, well, that can be difficult to enact, but nevertheless, there are, there are ways that you, that you go about it. If you have somebody who reveals a threat, uh, a risk of harm imminently to an identifiable individual or group, that sets off what, uh, what is known as the Tarasov obligation. And that is an obligation to take some action to protect the identified individual uh, or group from harm. Now, that action may be to hospitalize the patient. That's a clinical judgment. It may be to increase the medication that the patient is on or it may be in, in extreme circumstances um, to call the police department uh, uh, in the town uh, where the threat may exist or, or the state police. Um, you, um, I know, have expressed some concern also about what you see as sort of a loophole or an odd contradiction uh, right around these questions, uh, specifically having to do with the difference between voluntary and, and involuntary commitment. Well, I have. Um, last year, the uh, legislature in it, its bipartisan panel that passed the gun uh, school safety and mental health legislation um, passed uh, a requirement that all patients who are voluntarily hospitalized have to be reported to the Department of Mental Health by the hospital at which, in which they've been hospitalized. The, the DMH, uh, DMH will then in turn inform the state police that will um, do the check necessary to ascertain whether that person possesses guns or has an application for a gun permit in place. If they have an application, that will, uh, of course, be invalidated. And if they have guns, those guns will ultimately have to be turned over. Now, what the legislature missed was that they focused on voluntary patients, I think believing that all involuntary patients were already required to give up their guns under current law. But that's not true. There's a group of patients, and in fact it is the largest subset of involuntary patients, who are hospitalized under what's called a physician emergency certificate. This is not a commitment. It doesn't go to court. It's a hospitalization involuntarily on the basis of the judgment of a physician in the emergency room, seconded by the judgment of another physician once the patient reaches the hospital. So in Connecticut right now, we have the paradoxical, almost ironic situation in which voluntary patients have to give up their gun rights. Patients who have been all the way on the other extreme, committed by a court, have to give up their gun rights. But those people who are brought in in the midst of what is usually a significant danger to self or others and who don't realize that they have to come into a hospital and are hospitalized against their will by a doctor, they get to keep their gun rights. Um, first of all, I saw you nodding over yeah. there. That apparently conforms with your understanding. And, of the and my understanding is that that um, omission, whether inadvertent or not, uh, actually tracks federal law and um, federal courts' recent interpretations of of somewhat in, of gun restrictions that don't explicitly include these um, emergency commitments. And some, so. gu some gun rights advocates would say that's a good thing, right? They would say, look, no court has acted. There's been n n no judicial action whatsoever. It, one, one clinician seconded by another clinician has decided that I am a danger to myself or others. I, I'm therefore involuntarily hospitalized. Why should anybody be able to take my gun, gun rights away? Because these individuals represent a higher risk subset of the population than individuals uh, who are admitted voluntarily and certainly a higher risk than individuals who aren't uh, admitted at all. If we want to keep guns out of the hands of people who might be at risk, who might be dangerous, we have to set some standards. Mm -hmm. um, what are the standards that we're going to use? Well, Involuntary hospitalization requires a showing of harm to self or others, and therefore it, it stands out as, as one of the possible cutoffs that we ought to use. Interestingly, in order to avoid the focus that the mentally ill and the mentally ill hospitalized uh, are dangerous, we can turn to a, a report um, of experts who have recently looked at this. Uh, this is the Consortium of Risk-Based Firearm Policy, who've issued a report uh, entitled Guns, Public Health, and Mental Illness. And they point out that by using this dangerousness standard for 
mental health patients who are hospitalized, um, we can uh, equivalently use, uh, we can use equivalent dangerousness standards for individuals who are convicted of violent misdemeanors, uh, who are subject to temporary domestic violence restraining orders, uh, even individuals who've been convicted of two or more uh, DWIs uh, in a period of, of five years. So now the focus becomes not on the mentally ill, but on what's the right standard of dangerousness that we ought to employ in order to, to take guns temporarily out of the hands of people who, who could be dangerous. But Susan Schmeiser, that standard would have to be able to survive ju judicial review. Uh, and it seems to me that a kind of jump cut uh, from a medical assessment to the removal of guns is not going to get past Justice Scalia or a whole bunch of, of other federal judges. Um, well, Justice Scalia seems um, fairly comfortable with, ex with uh, eligibility requirements that exclude people based on mental illness. However, mm -hmm. that's defined in by what body. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that would survive. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I would want to say that whatever one thinks of the current Supreme Court's um, interpretation of the Second Amendment, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan, um, in a culture where gun ownership, um, or at least the possibility of gun ownership, has taken on this kind of status of a fundamental right, and therefore has become coextensive with citizenship, with what it means to be an American, it seems especially problematic to identify a particular group um, the mentally ill, quote unquote, and categorically exclude them, particularly when they're already demeaned and stigmatized, um, from this from this right that is really sort of at the core of American identity at the moment, and and that what we're what we're trying to do is get at dangerousness, right? And mental illness has become an unfortunate proxy, and I think an an inadequate proxy for dangerousness. And let's just get right at the question of dangerousness, as as this recent report by the consortium proposes. We're going to take a quick break here. We're going to come back with more. There's uh, a lot more than we will have time to cover today, but we'll be back with more post-final Newtown report. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me. Our intern is Jackie Lauper. For links, photos, and related articles, visit our website, wnpr.org. Tomorrow, get ready for New Year's Eve with a rebroadcast of our salute to the harmonica. Back to Colin. Hey, we're talking about the uh, final state uh, New Newtown shooting report. With us in studio, uh, Jeff Cohen, our reporter, uh, Dr. Hank Schwartz, uh, psychiatrist-in-chief at the Institute of Living, vice president of behavioral health at Hartford Hospital, Susan Schmeiser, a professor of law at UConn Law School who teaches mental health law. Um, Jeff, you had a question for Hank. I did. Well, obviously, one of the questions throughout this whole report is what would we have learned, what did we hope to learn from it about Adam Lanza's mental state? And, and we, learned, uh, we learned some things from reading them. Um, maybe n not as much as we would like, but one thing we learn is that we think he was diagnosed with Asperger's. I think we're fairly certain that that is a, a diagnosis that he received. But then he sort of stops getting treatment, uh, at least at one center, back in 06. His mother is, is, is called noncompliant in his care. She suggests to him that he stop taking medications that were prescribed to him because they uh, – at the at – the, uh, to the dismay of his health care provider. Uh, and then she didn't follow uh, schedule follow-up visits. So there, I guess there's two questions, Hank. Uh, on the one hand, we uh, a lack of does a, a lack of diagnosis doesn't necessarily mean that he may not have developed some other sort of mental illness later in his life. Uh, I guess that's a qu put a question mark at the end of that and rephrase it. Uh, but the second part of it is. What does this tell you as a healthcare provider about the role of his mother, or more broadly, if we're learning from this, the role of family in a person's health care? Well, to start with your first uh, question, um, clearly uh, he may well have developed another mental illness or, or disorder. And uh, as I suggested earlier, the last three months of his life, the little bit that we know about it, is suggestive of a significant deterioration into a complete isolation, isolation so extensive that he would speak to no one and communicated only with his, with his mother only uh, via email, living in a room uh, with taped, uh, windows taped with, with black plastic. I'm drawn to the one comment which uh, by, uh, by somebody who was interviewed as, as a friend of Nancy Lanza's that 
uh, she had said, Nancy had said, that he'd become uh, increasingly despondent during this time. Did he develop a severe depression? Was it a psychotic depression with delusional thinking? Uh, we'll never know, uh, but it's, it's certainly possible. Uh, your second question, the issue of, of families and compliance or noncompliance. Noncompliance, now referred to usually as non-adherence, is a huge problem uh, in behavioral health. And there are real limits as to what we can do about it, whether the source of noncompliance is the parent um, or it is uh, the patient, him or herself. People have a right to refuse the recommendations of their caregivers. The numbers of people who take an antidepressant, that was the medication that was prescribed uh, for Adam Lanza, uh, that uh, was discontinued shortly after it was started. The number of people who ultimately discontinue their antidepressants uh, for one reason or another, including just not believing that they really need it, um, is great. Um, our laws protect the autonomy and the rights of individuals um, to refuse and parents to refuse uh, for their children. Another irony here, of course, is that the very organ of autonomous decision-making that we're protecting is diseased. And so we, we protect the rights of people to make decisions for themselves when it is decision-making itself that may be most impaired uh, by mental illness. We're very, very careful in Connecticut um, in attempting to address the right balance here. Last year, we had an outpatient commitment law. This was based on the needs largely of families who are tearing their hair out about the noncompliance of their adult children who are currently hospitalized, come out of the hospital, discontinue their treatment, bounce back into hospital, deteriorate um, into homelessness, living on the streets, crime, and ultimately in incarceration. An outpatient commitment statute in Connecticut was proposed to address this problem in a way that would have violated individual rights in very minor ways, um, leaving people subject to an outpatient commitment only for months, uh, no more at a time. And here in Connecticut, we could not pass a bill like that into law, though outpatient commitment uh, exists in 36 or 38 other states in the United States. You know, uh, Susan Speiser, this is an interesting area to get into in, in, in terms of law. In, in the case of Adam Lanza, once again, you know, most of the symptom presentations aren't really super extreme. So you do have a guy, a young guy who's on, um, you know, uh, I think a pretty common antidepressant who goes off it and he and his mother both say he can't lift his arm uh, while he's on it. That's obviously not one of the side effects of that medication to the best of my knowledge. But as Hank's suggesting, the person who's being treated is the person who has the disease who's going to have odd perceptions about what the medication is doing. And maybe Adam Lanza is sort of the wrong test case to look at this. But in, the, in this whole area of noncompliance, and you can see in this report – a story that is very familiar. I mean, it's, uh, you know, in a thousand or 10,000 other, you know, psych cases uh, around the state and the nation, uh, this whole idea of people not wanting to take their meds or thinking the meds don't work. Um, where is the law on that? I mean, obviously, in most common cases, nobody should ever be forced to take a medication. They don't trust or they don't want or they don't, they don't think that they need. But is there at some, some point at which sort of the public health version of, me of mental health law jumps in? Um. Well, yeah, so before uh, before reading portions of the report that came out on Friday and, and the, certainly the media coverage of it, yeah, I think that my understanding and maybe the, the um, common understanding of what had happened or, um, of, of Lanza's relationship to his um, mental health care was that he had refused to take medication or been in denial about his condition or otherwise resisted treatment, but um, but at least I learned something when I read that that, it, that Nancy Lanza actually was at least complicit and and perhaps um, even more um, instrumental in discontinuing his treatment when he was what fourteen or fifteen, so he was still a minor. Um, and I had been thinking about what what yeah what what can the law do here um, in the in that sort of case where um, where a parent is noncompliant with treatment. There's very little that that we can do. Um, state intervention overriding parental decision making authority is really limited, right? Um, and generally only permissible when parents are clearly acting contrary to their ch child's best interests. Um, uh, 
there is this sort of concept of medical neglect and specifically mental health neglect that's kind of taking shape, but but at least the latter um, version of it, mental health neglect, is really not very well articulated or understood or accepted yet, partly because the treatment modalities are so variable and, un, and uncertain. And it's not, it's not like a, a case in which a child has um, a cancer for which there's a clear treatment and is, you know, the, the life, potentially life-saving treatment and is refusing that treatment. Um, in terms of adults, uh, right to refuse medication, that's very, that's, that's um, an essential part of this autonomy right. And unless uh, medication is clear, you know, is clearly warranted um, and the person is a danger to self or others without medication and, and the medication is, is clearly medically appropriate, et cetera, there's very little we can do and perhaps should do to force people to take medication against their will. You know, we're running out of time here. Um, you know, Hank, and this is not a public policy question. It's I think, more of a psychiatric question. But one of the things that's been so clear, both in the Sedensky report and in, then in, the, in what we can find in, in this uh, document dump here, is habituation. You know, and it's habituation is, of course, one of the human qualities that allows us to survive in a lot of situations. We take something that's abnormal, that's horrible, that's oppressive to us, and we habituate to it. We learn to live with it. We even make it part of our understanding of what normal life is. You have this family here that, to outside eyes, seems to be dealing with a highly abnormal situation. This uh, incredibly withdrawn uh, young man, uh, this uh, uh, preponderance of firearms all over the place, uh, and you know all kinds of other sort of linked symptoms and the incredible weight loss. You know he's he's down to, to kind of a stick figure. Um, to a lot of outside eyes, this is something like a crisis. To them, it wasn't a crisis, right? Because they'd learned to live with it. Everybody had kind of gotten used to this idea that this is how life is, and this is sort of part of living with Adam. Once again, this is a big challenge for your profession, right? People learn to live with things that maybe they shouldn't learn to live with. You know, it, it's interesting. That that starts when you're trying to teach medical students um, who are in, sitting in a room uh, with psychotic uh, individuals who are not exactly making sense. And because you're sort of not used to looking for symptoms and seeing pathology, you actually, if you're naive to this, you, you actually find the way to think that what they're saying actually does make sense. And so an experienced interviewer comes out of the room with the medical student and says, wow, did you get what you, what you just saw there? And the naive medical student doesn't know what you're talking about. And so, yeah, of course, um, this is a huge issue. And I think um, as difficult as it is to really get the story out of this, what you're calling, I think appropriately, the document dump, it is a part of the story that comes through. And that is that um, Nancy Lanza a- a- appeared to have been, I would say, worn down into submission um, by the extreme difficulty of, of dealing with um, a son who was so socially let's call it maladjusted in so many ways and made such demands um, upon her that um, the easiest path was the, the path of, of, of non-resistance. But that doesn't mean that had the authorities, whoever they might be, or a mental health professional, come in six months before Sandy Hook, they would have found anything that necessarily warranted um, any kind of intervention other than perhaps, you know, recommendations. It's now time for me to say thank you. Uh, obviously, this conversation isn't over as much as the um, state wants closure. And I think a lot of people do want closure for a lot of very good reasons. Uh, this story is going to stay with us for a very long time, probably be part of our molecular structure here in Connecticut. I do want to thank Jeff Cohen, our reporter here at WNPR, Dr. Hank Schwartz from the Institute of Living and Hartford Hospital, uh, Susan Schmeiser, professor of law from University of Connecticut School of Law. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back tomorrow with a very different kind of show.